Well, first of all, thanks very much for the invitation. I mean, it was a, it's a real honor uh, to come down here and speak to you all tonight. Uh, and thanks to Ken for asking me to come down here to this uh, wonderful place. Uh, tonight, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about roving the solar system, uh, the enterprise that this nation's been running for about the last 50 some years to send spacecraft out uh, beyond our Earth to the other planets in our solar system to find out what they're like, what are their surfaces like, what's on them, uh, and to find out if there's any sign that life might exist or have once existed on some of these planetary bodies. Uh, we've been doing this for 50 years, uh, and in fact, we've made a great deal of progress in those 50 years. Uh, we've, of course, been to the moon with robotic spacecraft like this one here, uh, and then we've also been with human beings uh, as, as well. We've visited every planet in the solar system in those last 50 years. We even now have an orbiter circling Mercury, which is the planet most close to the sun. Uh, we've been to the surface of Venus. This is mainly a Russian enterprise. This is a picture taken from a, a Russian lander in the late, late 70s on the surface of Venus. And of course Mars, which is the planet that uh, is most intriguing to the mind of man. And the reason for that, of course, is because it has an environment, uh, amongst all the planets, it has an environment that most closely resembles our own. It has an atmosphere albeit very thin, about one one hundredth uh, the, the thickness of our own. It has clouds. You can see these nice polar clouds here in the North Pole, some in the South. It has, it has polar caps made of water ice. Here's the southern polar cap uh, in winter. And it has this intriguing set of features, all colored in this rust red color. And we've sent many spacecraft to Mars. <coughs> Here's the first rover that was sent back in the mid-90s, nestled up against a rock where it's trying to make measure composition. Uh, we've been beyond Mars to the outer parts of the solar system. We've been out beyond Neptune. We have an orbiter now orbiting Saturn. And we've even put a lander on one of the large moons of, of Saturn, which I'll talk about uh, in a little bit. Uh, but the point is, after after 50 years of exploration, we now have uh, developed our technologies to the point where we have very sophisticated spacecraft that can land, rove, and examine the surfaces of these planets. We've got very sophisticated uh, instruments, scientific instruments, which can, which can analyze the surfaces of these bodies. And, and we now can dare to ask, are we alone? Uh, in this solar system. Uh, is, is there life elsewhere? I mean, this is the kind of question that human beings have asked themselves for a long time, even before we had a space program. Uh, and is life a cosmic imperative? In other words, does it happen in every instance where there's an environment that can support life? Or is it somehow special to our own planet? We don't know the answer to that, but most scientists suspect that life is, in fact, a process that is much more common in the universe than we might have otherwise thought. And if there is other life, is, is that life different or is it the same as ours? And so these are the, these are the big questions uh, for uh, science in the 21st century. Uh, well, what might we hope to find out there? Well, one thing we know already uh, after 50 years, we're not going to find any of these. Uh, at least not in our solar system. This is an illustration taken uh, from a Jules Verne book back in the turn of the 20th century. But it's still possible that we might find out there some of these. This, in fact, this layer here, you can see here in this rock, that's all bacteria. This is single cell life, microbial life, living in a rock below the surface. Uh, and this rock was taken from about a mile deep uh, in the Earth, and it's living on hydrogen coming from the interior. does not need light uh, at all. Uh, and there are environments like this on other planets. Maybe some of these things exist there. This is bacteria growing on an ice, uh, on ice in Antarctica, uh, at very cold, near-frozen temperatures. 
Uh, and so these are the kinds of things one might expect we could go look for uh, on the planets of our solar system. And this whole search is informed by a lot of recent discoveries about life on our own planet, what life here is like. The last two decades in biological research have been absolutely astounding. We've discovered that microbial life can live in, in very extreme environments. I just talked about a bacteria living in a rock a mile below the surface. Also very deep in Earth's oceans, uh, tens of thousands of feet uh, below the surface where there are volcanic vents, you find life. And the life is living off of the volcanic gases that come out of these vents. And that supports a whole community of not just microbial, uh, but uh, other types of animal life as well. No sunlight at all. And we've made major strides in understanding the relationship of uh, all the different kinds of life on our planet. The, this, is the, this is a genealogy of life on our planet going backwards in time. Uh, as you get closer towards this little root here, these are the older, more simpler organisms. There are three branches to the tree of life, archaea, bacteria, and eukaryotes. And all of the multicellular animals on this planet are way out here on this branch, way out here. We're on the very tip out here. It turns out that the, the greatest mass of, of biology on this planet is single-celled microorganisms. We also know that it's very old. All of, these, all of this genetic work leads us back to what everyone calls the the, uh, co the ancient con uh, common ancestor. Uh, and we don't know what that is like, but we know that there had to have been one. And in fact, we know that life is very old on this planet. This is a, this is, these are fossils from a, from a rock that's three and a half billion years old. That's only one billion years after the Earth formed. So not only uh, life form uh, a large number of different kinds of species, uh, it also formed them uh, quite fast. So this new understanding uh, leads us to believe, leads us to understand actually, that, that life on this planet is, is not this fragile process clinging to a very narrow and threatened environment. Life on this earth is, is pervasive and it's tenacious. Uh, it's environmentally tough. Microbes, uh, can exist in extreme temperatures, all the way up to boiling water. They can exist at freezing temperatures. They can endure extreme pressures, such as at the bottom of the ocean, or several miles below the Earth's surface. They can live in uh, very acidic pools, and volcanic pools that are very acidic and acid, that would take the skin right off your finger. There, there are microbes that are very comfortable in that environment. They can exist in high alkalinity, in, in very saline environments uh, where the concentration of salt is so high that it would kill any fish. Uh, they can eat just about anything. Uh, microbes can live on hydrogen, they can live on methane, alcohols, sulfur compounds, even metals. Uh, a microbe is essentially a little battery. And you know how your battery works. You've got one side of the battery has a, a chemical that's got a lot of electrons and more than it needs. And the other side of the battery is a chemical that doesn't have enough electrons and wants more. And all the battery does is it moves electrons from one to the other and create energy in that process. That's exactly what a microbe does to create the energy it needs to live and grow. And so there's many different kinds of chemicals it can use to do that. Uh, microbes are pervasive. They're found in very arid environments. Uh, the Atacama Desert in, in Chile at, at uh, upwards 15,000 feet. They're found in the Arctic, the frozen Arctic. They're find on, found in hydrothermal vents uh, where we have hot steam coming out, creating uh, very acidic hot pools. Uh, they're tenacious. Uh, microbes on this planet will colonize deep rocks. The top, they exist on the top of mountaintops. Uh, and they survive long-term cold, heat, radiation, dryness. Um, their life on this planet is extremely tough. We're not necessarily human beings. We're a little bit fragile. But wherever you find uh, an environment on this Earth, 
uh, anywhere you go, you will find life. You could, you could scrape the entire top of the planet off, and life would still thrive here. So we've come to know that microbial life on this planet is pervasive. Uh, you, the Earth is really infected with life. It's everywhere, from the surface to miles below. Uh, and it thrives in these very difficult environments that can exist on other planets. Uh, and these other planets may have had more suitable climates in their past than they do now. And we know that, in fact, about Mars. I'll talk a little bit more of that in a minute. And life needs just three things. It needs liquid water. All life on this planet requires liquid water in order to, in order to work. It also needs a source of what we call the biogenic elements. It needs some carbon, it needs some nitrogen, it needs some oxygen, some phosphorus and sulfur. It needs all these elements in order to build the structures uh, that make it work and to create the energy that make it go. And that's where the energy comes from, some source of chemical energy. And it, it can be just about anything. Uh, and so we only need to search for these conditions on another planet to determine if, in fact, we might be able to look for life there look for places where we might find liquid water or some carbon and nitrogen or where there might be some source of energy for life to use. So where should we look? Well, the solar system has eight planets and this little dwarf planet out here called Pluto. Uh, and they come in families. There's the terrestrial planets, the ones closest to the sun, uh, rocky bodies. Then there's the gas giants, Jupiter and Saturn. They have no surfaces. Uh, they just, the gas just gets higher and higher in pressure as you go in, inside them. Then the so-called ice giants, Uranus and Neptune. Uh, they may have some ice buried deep within them. And then this, this icon of what we call now the, the Plutonian planets, the ice dwarfs. There are, there are upwards of thousands of these. And Pluto is only really one example of them. But I'm going to focus. Uh, most of the talk on the terrestrial planets here. So we know that life, life evolved on one of those planets, uh, that, that blue one in the middle there, and so can we find it anywhere else? Well, these are the, the three inner, <coughs> the inner planets. Uh, this is Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. So what are their surface environments like? Well, let's take a look at Mercury. Mercury is the closest one to the sun, and its surface is extremely hot. It has no atmosphere at all. It's, it's quite lunar-like. Uh, and the temperatures on the, on the day side are, are extremely high, over 400 degrees, and, and likewise, about 300 degrees below zero on the back side. No water to speak of at all. So that's very unlikely. Venus is a planet that's next inward from us towards the sun. Uh, it's about the same size as the Earth, but its surface environment is very, very different. It's a very hellish place. Uh, the atmosphere is mostly carbon dioxide with sulfuric acid clouds, uh, very heavy concentration of sulfuric acid in the, in the atmosphere. The surface pressure is about 90 times the pressure here in this room, and the surface temperature would melt lead. So this is not a very hospitable place. Earth we know about. It's in the Goldilocks zone. It's at the right distance from the sun. Water can be liquid, and it's got a very nice environment. We all really do enjoy, especially here in Pensacola, right? <laughs> Mars is the next planet out, uh, and as I mentioned before, it has an environment that's most like our own compared to all the rest. Uh, it's a smaller planet. It's colder. It's drier. The atmosphere is much thinner. It's about 1 one hundredth of uh, the pressure on the surface as it is uh, here. It's about the same as it would be about 130,000 feet. Uh, it's colder. It can get to uh, temperatures on the order of 70 degrees Fahrenheit on the equator during the summer. But it'll get to 180 degrees below zero uh, in, during the night. And the atmosphere is very thin, uh, and it's very, very dry. But nonetheless, it's worth investigating. And so where do we go, and how do we go about 
this whole process. The first thing to do is to follow the water. Water is such a key ingredient. Everywhere on this earth where we find water, even the slightest amount, we find life. No exception. Everywhere. So let's go look for the water. And here is a, and we'll do that first from orbit, because that's the easiest thing to do. And here is a map made by an instrument on an orbiter in the late 1990s, which looked for uh, subsurface water in the soil. It could detect water down to a depth of about uh, three feet or so in the soil. Uh, and it was, the blue is heavy concentration of water, and this is during the South Polar winter, and so there was a lot of water on the surface. But even in the, in, even in the north, in the summer, where there is no water on the surface, uh, uh, visible, no snow ice, if there is still some in the soil, and you see these reds and oranges, even in the equatorial regions, that means that there is a significant amount of water in the soil depth, down to a depth of about three feet, most likely in the form of ice. And we've taken a lot of images and mapped the entire planet, and we found plenty of evidence for there having been water on the surface of Mars in its past. And most scientists believe that Mars in its, in its early history was very similar to what the Earth was at the same time. Its first, the first uh, quarter or third of its history, we believe that Mars had a warmer and wetter environment because there's so many signs of there having been water on the surface in the past. I mean, here's a, here's a meandering river uh, that was cut into the plains here. Uh, and it's even exposed sedimentary terraces uh, along, the, along the, the channel here. And you can see the final remnants of the last, last water to flow uh, in, this, in, this, uh, in this valley. And we see lots of these over the planet. Uh, here's another example. This is, this is a polygonal terrain, uh, very similar to what you would see in Alaska in the Arctic tundra. And the, and the, uh, the polygons are caused by the annual freeze-thaw cycle uh, that creates this kind of patterning. And here, this is harder to see. This is a, an area where it looks like there has been catastrophic flooding, where there was a burst of water from the soil at some occasion long ago, and that water flowed catastrophically uh, down slope, creating these teardrop-shaped islands and a debris flow of rock down here uh, in, in the valley. I'll just show you one more example. Uh, and here is one of these dendritic uh, flow channels that are very, very similar to what we see on the Earth at northern latitudes. These are glacial meltwater channels caused by the glaciers melting and flowing across the soil, making these, making these channels. So it seems clear that there was abundant water on Mars in its past, and the question is, well, where did it go? And where is it now? Uh, and so that's why we send landers. So in 2003, uh, we sent, NASA, NASA sent two rovers to Mars and sent them to the surface in two different kinds of areas. This, the first one was sent to a large crater, this is about 100 miles across, uh, that looked at least structurally like it had once been a lake. After the crater was formed, it was filled with water, and that water eventually eroded the rim and then drained out this channel that, that you can see at the bottom going down here. And so this looked like a good place to send a rover to look for signs of, of water on the surface. The other area chosen was a plane uh, and a orbiter using a spectrometer instrument had detected uh, a large concentration of a mineral called hematite uh, in, this, in this plane. It's called Meridiani Planum. Uh, and hematite is a mineral which is formed in water. Uh, it's the only way you can form it. And so the other rover was sent uh, to this area. Now, I'm going to, these are the rovers that were sent, uh, Spirit and Opportunity. And this is a picture of the Spirit rover just before it was packed up for launch. 
And you can see it's kind of the size of a, of a child's wagon. Uh, and it looks like a, kind of like a fly. It's got these wings that are the solar panels. Uh, and it's got a mast with a, with a, stereo, a stereo camera on top of it. And you can't see it very easily, but it's also got a, an articulated arm on the front of it. Like, so when it comes up to a rock, it can articulate the arm and put a set of instruments against the rock to determine what it's made out of. And here it is assembled for launch. The rover is in, tucked up inside this conical shell. This is the aero shell. And this cylindrical device here is the cruise stage that navigated it to Mars. Uh, landing on Mars is hard. Uh, it's one of the hardest planets to land on. And the reason is because it has just enough of an atmosphere to be a real pain. It caused a lot of difficulty. Uh, the moon, you can just land on it. Just turn your rockets on and land. Well, you can't do that on Mars because it's got enough of an atmosphere that you'll burn up. On the other hand, it doesn't have enough of an atmosphere, like the Earth does, to be a soft cushion. Uh, so by the time you try to cushion yourself, you've impacted the planet. So it takes uh, a, a, a very complex sequence of aero braking, parachute, rockets, and in this case, you'll see airbags. Now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you a video, uh, and the video is in two parts. It, it, it shows first this exciting sequence that's required to land these rovers on Mars, uh, and then it will show you the people in the operating center uh, who were there and present during that exciting process. It takes seven minutes to get the spacecraft from 15,000 miles an hour, thereabouts, to zero with this complicated sequence of, of braking. Uh, and these people who have worked on this have worked on it sometimes half their lives. And I'd like you to focus a little bit on the people you see in this video. Uh, they're the ones who are operating this, who've built it. And I'd like you to notice they're mostly young. There's some folks with gray hair like me. You know, uh, but they're mostly young, they're very diverse, they're very passionate, and very emotional. This is, these are emotional events. To them, so we got rid of the cruise stage. This is the principal science investigator. For so many years, is on the line. Um, I mean, Now watch this. Okay. An Ill an inelegant way to land on Mars, but successful. Thank you. 
took me a while to even believe the signal was really there when Polly was saying, Rob, Rob, there's a signal. I go, where? Show me, show me. I don't see it yet. I think my main reaction was, <laughs> I think it's probably the main, the main thing. It's like, oh, we made it. Remember, this is happening 150 million miles away. images was we're safe it's working and worked it did uh, spirit lasted six years uh, opportunity is still alive and I'm going to show you some images from from opportunity who, who says scientists and engineers aren't passionate and excitable <laughs> spirit landed in Gusev crater this is a picture taken from an orbiter overhead shortly after the landing, and you can see some of the marks on the surface, the first bounce and the several bounces. It bounced about 50 times. And finally, it rolled to a stop here. That's, that's the lander right there. The heat shield that was a jettison crashed right here. It's on the side of the, uh, the crater. You can actually, here's a picture from the rover right there. And the parachutes ended up over here. Here's a picture of the parachutes taken from the rover. Spirit landed in what looked like a volcanic plain. There were rocks everywhere, reddish volcanic rocks. And when the analysis was made, when they rolled up to the rocks and articulated the arm and put the little instruments to get in the rocks, they discovered they were all volcanic. They were not, uh, not rocks that were made uh, in water. This was a basaltic lava flow a big disappointment. And so having found no sign of water here, they turned the rover and said, okay, we're gonna head for the hills, which are right here. They're about four or five kilometers away. It took about a year for the rover crawling at about a centipede pace to get there. Uh, and here's where it landed. Uh, and here's the path it took to get to these central hills. The, the idea was, Okay, we still think this crater was filled with water at one time because we see evidence of it uh, from the outflow. And so maybe what happened is the water dried out, some volcanoes happened, filled the basin with volcanic lava, covering over those sediments. Maybe we'll find evidence of them in this, this hilly area here which escaped the lava flooding. And when the rover started rolling up to the foothills here, sure enough, the rock types changed dramatically. And they began to see rocks that looked like they had been in contact with water. Uh, and then, so you can see the path of the rover, it climbed up over these hills and then back down again and, and it ended up down here. Uh, and during that process, one of its back <coughs> wheels locked up. It has six wheels, one of them locked up, and so it had to drag its wheel, you know, kind of like that. That's <laughs> Uh, and that turned out to be a good thing because it scraped off the top layers of the soil and every once in a while it would expose something underneath. And in this case what it exposed was a lot of white powder and the rover went back and analyzed it and found out it's silica dust. Now, you've got nice white sand here on your beaches. This is a hundred times finer. It's pure silica dust and it can only be made by precipitating out of standing water. So there was standing water here at one time, uh, slightly acidic, and it precipitated out all the silica, fine silica dust. Uh, and here's a picture from the uh, rover's final resting place. It finally succumbed to one of the winters. Winters are pretty harsh on, on Mars. And that's a picture of the hills that just, it had just uh, climbed over in the back. Now, the other rover uh, opportunity hit the jackpot. If Spirit had to work hard to find water, uh, Opportunity landed right on top of it, just about. Uh, here's, here's a picture taken from the orbiter 
uh, just after landing, about a week after landing maybe, about a week or two weeks. Anyway, you can see the scarring on the surface from those rocket motors uh, that were turned on just before landing. And as you probably can't see it in the audience, but you can see the bounce marks. And it ended up right square in the middle of this crater. It's about, crater, the crater is about the size of this room. Uh, a planetary hole in one. <laughs> I mean, th this, is, this, is, this is one heck of a golf shot. You know, 150 million miles. Uh, and here's a picture taken from the rover of the landing platform. Uh, and right away what you see is there are no rocks here at all. There's not a rock in sight. But what is in sight is the rim, the inside rim of that crater, bedrock. And that's exactly what they were looking for. Uh, and it has layers in it, so it looks sedimentary. Uh, and <coughs> The rover traveled from this crater over to this larger one and actually went down inside the rim and it found this, at the rim of the crater, more bedrock. And you can see no, no volcanic rocks of any kind. And then it traveled further south, it passed the heat shield, where the heat shield had crashed on the surface, that's the heat shield uh, as it passed by. And in using its instruments, uh, Opportunity found plenty of water sign. Here's that, here's that first layer of bedrock in the crater it landed in, and you can see that it's layered, and the rover drove up close to it, and here's a close-up, and you can see even finer layers. Uh, these are all laid down by sediment, sedimenting out of, out of standing water. And then you see these little scar marks. The scientists figured out that what these were, are these were the holes left in the rock from some crystals uh, that had been dissolved away by water flowing past them. And you'll notice this little thing here. It's about the size of a blueberry. You know, uh, not, not one of the nice uh, wild Maine blueberries, but one of those big commercial ones. Um, and they called them blueberries, uh, and they discovered that they were made of hematite. Remember I said that the orbiter had found <coughs> hematite all over the plane here? Well, that's where the hematite is. It's in these little blueberries, and you can see them scattered all over the place. They're everywhere you look. Look here. And they're made the same way an oyster makes a pearl. Uh, the water flows in little cracks, nucleates the, the beginning of a stone, and keeps precipitating material on the stone as the stone rolls around through the cracks and around, the, and around on, the, on the rock surface and creates a rounded, uh, uh, rock. And when it put its instruments up against it, it found that, uh, that not only was there hematite here, but a lot of this rock here is made of a mineral called jerosite, which is another mineral which is only made uh, in, in water, flowing or standing water. And in addition to that, there's lots of sulfur and chlorine in this material, which is sulfur and chlorine are, are soluble elements, and they're, they're present as, as uh, salt and as uh, sulfate. All evidence of having been processed, these rocks having been processed in water. Uh, it left, Opportunity left its landing site in that, uh, the crater I just showed you and went south to another crater, a larger one, and discovered yet again more evidence of there having been uh, a really a lake, a standing lake in this area in the past. This is kind of a bathtub ring of rock which, is, which has been processed uh, by standing water. And then it kept going and going and going like the Energizer Bunny. Uh, and it took two years to go from that last crater I showed you all the way to the rim of this very large crater that's uh, two, kilometers, two kilometers across. Opportunity is right, not, right now, it's at the rim of this crater. Here's a picture taken this August when it arrived. And that's the rim here. Uh, and just a few weeks ago, as it was rolling to a place to, to huddle down for the winter and winter over, uh, it crossed this vein in a rock. It's about two inches across here. Uh, got curious about that and, and put its instruments on it and discovered that this is gypsum. This is the same stuff that's in your wallboard. You know, your, 
Uh, and gypsum is formed in the same kind of process. It's a mineral that's precipitated out of water. Uh, and so this entire area here at one point early in Mars's history was covered with water. Well, okay, so now we found out that there has been a lot of water in the past. Let's see if we can find some of it now, where it is now. And so to do that, we sent another lander uh, in 2007. This time it, it didn't use those, those funny airbags. And uh, we tried for the first time, uh, in modern times anyway, to use a propulsive system to land, and it worked successfully. And it, we said, well, let's also send it to one of the northern polar regions, because we know that there's a, a seasonal deposit of, of water there in the pole. So it landed at a very high northern latitude. And during the landing process, it just so happened that one of the over, orbiters was flying over the part of the planet where the Phoenix was, was landing and got a picture. This is the picture from the orbiter. This is a very large crater. And if you blow this little piece up here, you, get, you, see, the, the, you see this. And this is the, the lander on its parachute. Here's the lander down here, and that's on its parachute. It didn't land in, the, in, in here. It landed way as well south of it because of the perspective. That's the first time we've ever been able to do something like that. And shortly after landing, uh, the Phoenix lander took a picture of what was underneath the spacecraft, took its arm and looked underneath. Uh, and this is what it saw. These are the, these are the rocket nozzles uh, that uh, cushioned its landing. And believe, underneath each one of them is this cleared area where the rocket blew the soil away and exposed solid ice. This is permafrost. And it's only about a centimeter, half an inch or an inch, below that, that uh, soil. And here's, here's, the, here's the articulated arm with the digger on the end of it. It dug these trenches to take samples of the soil to put in its instruments to determine what the soil was like. And it hit the ice layer. You can see the ice here. And it turns out that the soil is a, is a slightly alkaline soil, uh, and, a, and it's got a, a decent number of mineral nutrients in it. Uh, and many Earth-like plants would be quite happy uh, growing in that soil. So, OK, well, now we've found that there's lots of water on Mars. OK, it's, it's ice, but it's near the surface. And we can, we can access it. Uh, and there's lots of water beneath the soil. And at some point, if you go down far enough into the soil, it'll, the temperatures go up, and you'll probably end up having some liquid water. Liquid water. Uh, and so the next step is, let's go back to one of those places where we have signs of, of water in the past, and let's see if there are some biogenic elements there. Was Mars ever habitable? OK, so it had water. But was it actually habitable? Did it have the other things necessary for life? Did it have the carbon and the nitrogen and the oxygen? Uh, are there sources of chemical energy that, that uh, microbes could live on? And that's the goal of the next rover. And here's a picture of it. Uh, this one is the size of a Volkswagen. And instead of solar panels, it has a thermonuclear generator, so it has a nuclear battery. So it can drive at night and do its, uh, it doesn't have to wait for sunlight to power it up. It has a mass that's, the, uh, that's six feet tall from the bottom of the wheel to the top, six feet tall. So it's human height, and it's a stereo camera. Uh, and it has another one of these articulated arm with lots of instruments on the end to, to look at the composition, this time the mineral composition and the organic, potential organic composition of the soil. This was, this was launched. This is, this is uh, uh, this, this uh, rover was called Curiosity, and it was launched uh, November 30th, I think it was. Uh, and it has yet a different landing system. And the reason is because it's so big, this thing weighs a ton, that the, you can't use airbags because airbags don't scale properly. They just have, the airbags would have to be so big, they'd weigh too much. Uh, so it has to use a propulsive landing system. Uh, but this one is very unique.
That's the... This one has a controlled entry. So it's actually guiding itself so we can have a more precise landing. Now watch this. This is called a sky crane. Now, you think that'll work? <laughs> it did better. Um, it's actually a very clever way to do this because it, it's one of the few ways in which you can land actually very heavy things uh, on Mars. Uh, and so we're always trying something new and we'll see how she works out. Landing is scheduled for the, the wee hours of August 5th and 6th, so stay tuned. <laughs> and where it's going to land is right here. This is Gale Crater. And the reason it's going there is because the, our orbiters have told us that the bottom of this little central mountain, which is about as tall as Everest, by the way, the bottom of this is rooted in the early, early crust of Mars, when Mars was young. Uh, and as you go up in height, you go, it get to younger and younger and younger ages. And so we'd like to get uh, a whole history of the planet by exploring that central peak and looking for any sign of organic material uh, in the soil uh, and any sign of chemical, uh, uh, chemicals that could, that could power life on, on, on Mars. Okay, I'm going to leave Mars because there's lots more to do uh, and, the, curi and the, the, the Curiosity rover uh, will surely bring us back some very, very exciting results. But Mars is not the only place where we think it might be possible that life might have existed or could now exist. Uh, and one place is Europa, which is one of the moons of Jupiter, the biggest planet in the solar system, out beyond Mars. Uh, Jupiter has four very large moons. They're called the Galileans. Uh, and here's, here's uh, one. This is, this is Ganymede, which is bigger than the planet Mercury. And this one here is Europa. And it's very, very bright and almost totally ice covered. There are some reddish, brownish colorations on the surface. But if you look, up, look at Europa up close, it looks like a, like a giant cracked billiard ball, like a billiard ball you got from your grandfather or something. Had a lot of use. And you look up even closer, there are areas that look like the ice has been melted, uh, in the, and then these icebergs have broken away and then refrozen uh, in place. And what we think Europa is, is that there is an ocean underneath this ice covering a global ocean completely covering the moon. This moon's about the size, uh, Europa's about the size of our own moon, so it's not very big. Uh, and that this ice covering is about 10 to 20 kilometers thick. And that the ocean could be as much as 50 or 80 kilometers deep. Uh, and uh, we're seeing episodes of where uh, plumes of water come up towards the surface and cause it to cause it to remelt uh, and then refreeze. And the only reason that there could be liquid water here, because this is way beyond Mars, this is out so far into the solar system where ice, where water is normally ice because it's so cold, excuse me, cold out there. The only reason this could be liquid, be sustained as a liquid and not freeze, is if the surface underneath is very hot. And the surface underneath would be hot only because there was volcanic action uh, at, at the bottom of this, of this ocean. Now, remember what I showed you in one of the earlier slides, volcanic vents at the bottom of an ocean? That's the recipe for life on this planet. And so that's one reason why we are so very interested in Europa. And the things that prevent us or cause us uh, a lot of trouble in figuring out how to do this is because this ice layer is so thick 
Uh, we haven't figured out a way to get through it. And the other reason is because Europa sits so close to Jupiter that it's in, embedded in its radiation belts. Uh, a human being would last about, uh, if, if you had a uh, spacesuit, a human being would last oh, probably three or four minutes on the surface of Europa before he would be fried by radiation. So there's lots of obstacles to overcome. <laughs> but life under here doesn't need to worry about the radiation because this ice covering would stop it, stop it within a few inches. So Europa is one place we're very interested in. And further out again uh, is the planet Saturn, my favorite planet. It's a gorgeous, beautiful planet. Uh, and it has a lot of, it has a big retinue of moons as well. And here's a picture taken from the, the Cassini spacecraft that's now orbiting Saturn. It's been there since 2004, orbiting, orbiting the planet. This is Titan. Titan is as, is as big as the planet Mercury. It's the only moon in the entire solar system that has an atmosphere. And it's a thick one. It's one and a half times as thick as our own atmosphere. It's made of mostly nitrogen, like our, like our atmosphere is. Uh, and so the only problem is it's extremely cold. It's about 300 degrees below zero at the surface. But here's what, here's, here's what Titan looks like on a, on a close pass from the Cassini spacecraft when close by. It's, it's very reddish in color. Uh, that's all haze in the atmosphere, and the atmosphere is completely loaded with this organic, soupy, hydrocarbon haze. Uh, and that's because the, the atmosphere, while it's mostly nitrogen, has a fair percentage of methane in the atmosphere. At the temperatures of Titan, 300 degrees below zero, methane can be either a liquid, a gas, or a solid depending on what side of that, little, that temperature you are. So in the atmosphere of Titan, methane has the same role that water has in our atmosphere. In our atmosphere, water can be liquid or gas or a solid. Uh, at 300 degrees below zero, water ice is as hard as granite. So the rocks on Titan are going to be made of water. And this gas up here, methane, uh, well, can be, it can rain, it can form clouds, and maybe even lakes, which I'll go on to show you. Uh, here's what Titan looks like in the infrared, where you can see through the clouds. In the infrared, you can actually, it's like night vision goggles, you can see through the clouds. And you can see that it has these dark, flat areas, and it's got these lighter colored upland regions. These are clouds. These are methane clouds uh, in the atmosphere. And we actually sent a probe into the atmosphere and landed on the surface of Titan. This is a panorama taken from the lander on the parachute at about a height of about one kilometer. Uh, again, that reddish organic haze. Uh, here, what looked like, very much like shorelines, a very flat area, the, either a lake or a, or a a marsh bog and islands in that. Uh, at a higher altitude looking straight down, this is what this area looks like. You can see these shorelines and clear evidence that some liquid, some fluid, has flowed from the high areas down into this low dark area. Uh, and in fact, the Huygens lander landed right on the edge, right on the shore of one of these little islands, and that's what it looked like on the surface. This is about the size of a grapefruit, and that is not a rock, that's an ice ball. And it's rounded. So it's been moved and rolled around by some fluid. Uh, and that fluid is almost certainly a, meth a, a, a hydrocarbon lake. There has been fluid, liquid, here before. Uh, and it's not water, but it's hydrocarbon fluid. It's, nat it's natural gas. This place is just loaded with natural gas. And here's a radar picture taken over the northern hemisphere. And these dark areas we now know are lakes. We don't know how deep they are. This, this is about the size of Lake Superior. So these lakes are holding a lot of fluid. It's the only other place in the entire solar system where we have found liquid other than liquid water on Earth. 
but it's pretty cold. Titan, uh, Saturn also has another interesting moon, Enceladus. This moon is, is, is extremely bright. It's almost pure ice, water ice. Uh, it's about a third the size of our own moon, so it's pretty small. But when you see, when you look at this moon, you see all this flat area down here, free of craters with all these linear grooves. Uh, when you look at the, look at the, uh, the moon sideways, like as in this picture, you can see that there are plumes coming out of these fissures. And the spacecraft has flown through these plumes and shown them to be water ice. So there is water ice being projected out of the moon and inside, and, and it's not just water ice, but another instrument detected organic material uh, being spewed out as well. And so what this means is underneath this crust somewhere, there is a fluid reservoir, a water reservoir, uh, that, is, that is exposed to these cracks in the surface, and that water is being pressed up out of those cracks to make plumes that go out hundreds of miles into space, and there's some organic material mixed with it. Uh, but we don't have the right instruments on Cassini to do a very, really detailed analysis of that organic material, and that's why we want to go back there. Well, so after all of this, what can we sort of expect to find in our own solar system? Well, we're not going to find critters like us. Uh, we know they're not there. We're not going to find animals or even multicellular life, most likely. But what we can hope to find uh, in Europa or Enceladus are perhaps microbes on Mars. Maybe we can find microbes if we go deep enough. We'll have to go find that liquid water Underneath the, underneath the surface. And on Europa and Enceladus we, have, and Enceladus, we had to get below the surface again to where those liquid reservoirs are and that liquid ocean are. And even on Titan, even though it's far too cold for life as we know it, there's so many hydrocarbons there that the kind of chemical processes that are happening on that body may be very similar to those that happened on our own early Earth to, to create the molecules that life needed to start in the first place. And so it's not, that's why Titan uh, is very interesting to us. And, and what about beyond the solar system? I mean, we already know that there are planets around other stars. One of the greatest discoveries in the last, last 10, 15 years has been the discovery that there are planets around other stars. We're finding more and more of them all the time. Uh, and uh, there are about 2,000 of them cataloged now, 2,000 stars with planets around them that we know about. Uh, some of those are Earth-sized. Of that 2,000 or so, about 50 of them are about Earth-sized. Uh, and one of them, at least one of them so far, has been confirmed to be within that habitable zone, that distance from its star, that water can be liquid. And so maybe one of the greatest discoveries of the 21st century will be another planet, very similar to our Earth, blue, white clouds, uh, and oceans, continents, and maybe even what comes along with those in our own planet, life. And I'll stop there. Thank you for your attention. Questions? Your hand went up first. Thank you very much for an engaging lecture. With futurists and scientists like yourself, are any, anyone that you know of that's thinking outside the box and considering a parallel universe? Ah, well, that's, that, that's a matter for the physicists. The physicists are having a great a lot of fun with that, uh, trying to understand their, you know, black holes, the Big Bang. Uh, a lot of that physics leads them to postulate that there might be parallel universes. Uh, but uh, right now, that's a strictly theoretical mathematical construct. There was one in the back. Way in the back. Then I'll come. Hi, thank you so much for uh, being here tonight. Um, I had one question. I know it's a leap. But um, assuming that we will eventually find that there is life somewhere else, whether it's in our solar system or in an exosystem, the next question in my mind is, does their DNA match our own? 
And in order to answer that, we're going to have to bring something back to Earth. Is there long-range planning going on for that endeavor? The only long-range planning for a sample return <coughs> is, is from Mars. The next steps after that Curiosity rover will be to bring the sample back to the Earth from some spot that uh, we think is the best place to try to find a rock or, or a sample that might have uh, fossilized evidence of life of some kind or another. Uh, but beyond that, there's, there's no, no plans to bring samples back. But that's a pretty hard thing to do, very hard thing to do. Uh, and the, the interesting part of your question is, is would their DNA be like ours? And there's already some experiments in, in the laboratory which indicate that, that uh, you can make these kinds of molecules, uh, these large DNA-like molecules, out of bases that are somewhat different than the ones we use. You can make peptide chains out of somewhat different amino acids than we use. You can make the, 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 the backbone of DNA out of different kinds of sugars and phosphates than we use. Uh, but the only example of one that we really know works is our own. A few years ago, uh, there was a good bit of interest in excess methane emissions from Mars, suggesting that there may be uh, subsurface biology, uh, like the archaea, uh, bacteria and stuff you were discussing earlier. Uh, any follow-ups from any of the orbiters or uh, do we have the ability to detect methane vents uh, with any Curiosity or any of the other uh, landers? Yeah, I, I, I should have mentioned that. Curiosity has, a, has, a, has two instruments on board uh, to look for and analyze uh, the, methane. Uh, the methane. The methane has been observed from Earth observatories. Uh, it was totally unexpected because uh, methane will oxidize in the atmosphere of Mars within s two or three weeks. It shouldn't be there. And since it is there, it's a very small amount, but the fact that it is there means that there has to be some source feeding the atmosphere with it because it's be it constantly goes, it, you know, it'll be constantly to be destroyed. Uh, and there's two notions of how the methane got there. One is, is geochemical. You can make methane uh, geochemical, <coughs> through geochemical means, or you can make it from biology. That's one of the major byproducts of biology on this planet is methane. Now, the good news is you can tell those two apart because they have different isotope abundances of the carbon. Uh, and so on the Curiosity rover, they're going to measure how much methane is there, look at its daily variation, and measure the carbon isotope abundance. Uh, that's another result I would really look forward to saying. Time for one more question. Right here. The other night, there was a, a TV show on a local public television on space, and there was a controversial issue whether Pluto was or was not a planet. Uh, would you want to comment a little bit about uh, why they, some people would say it wasn't and why some people say it was? Well, I love Pluto. I'm disappointed to see it being demoted. Uh, but and in fact, it's not the first planet to be demoted. Uh, the first one was Ceres back in the 1800s. Uh, the first asteroid discovered was the biggest of them. It's called Ceres. In fact, there's a spacecraft that's going to get there in a couple of years. Uh, and it was called a planet. Uh, and then when it was discovered that it wasn't alone, that in fact there were thousands and tens of thousands of other asteroids in the same belt between Mars and Jupiter, it was demoted. Uh, and uh, the same thing happened to Pluto. Uh, we've known about Pluto since 1930. Uh, but in the recent 15 years or so, we've discovered thousands more bodies similar to Pluto and another large belt beyond Neptune. So there's lots of Plutos out there. Uh, and so Pluto got demoted. Uh, and it's, uh, it's interesting because, in fact, it has four moons. We've, we've discovered that it has four moons, one very big one uh, relative to its own size. 
um, and the others are, f are fairly small. So it's a little planetary system on its own, but we, it's been given this official name of ice dwarf. So it's a dwarf planet, it's very small. It's called an ice dwarf. Ceres is called a is, a, is a rocky dwarf because it's closer to the sun. So we can still call it a planet, but you have to say dwarf planet. <laughs> <laughs> Thank our speaker.